Good morning, everyone. So it took me a little while to get some internet today, but I finally have some. So let me just let um, Ariel in. Participants. Hi, Gail. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Gail Tamarchi. I'm the Director of Wellness Initiatives for Friends Life Care. And um, welcome to class number two of our Alexander Technique series led by Ariel Weiss. And um, like I said, I'm sorry it took me a little bit longer to get on. It took a while to get some internet today, but I um, hope none of you had any problems because of the storms yesterday. So Ariel, thank you very much. Um, I will be moderating again if anybody has any questions. And um, so you can just work on teaching the class. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Gail. And um, let's give Gail, let's give her a round of applause for her heroic <laughs> efforts this morning literally through Storm and Dell to get us all online. So thank you, Gail. Um, My pleasure. Welcome to week two, everybody. It was such a pleasure to get started last week. And I just want to kind of orient everyone again. We've got you all muted um, so that uh, you'll be able to hear me better. Um, but if you have a question or comment, then I encourage you to put that in the chat. Um, and Gail's going to help me out by kind of letting me know if there are questions. We also have some international signs. Uh, if you all scroll down at the bottom of your screen, there is a box. There is, uh, it's called reactions. It's on the far right. And if you can find it right now, uh, there's a thumbs up reaction. If you can all give me a thumbs up, if you're able to hear me, see me, that'd be awesome. Thank you so much. Um, that's a great way to stay connected when there's so many of you and I can't hear you. And then uh, there's the applause one if you feel so inclined, but that's okay. I might often check in with you. Now, if you're in a situation where it's hard for you to get to the computer to give a thumbs up, that's always an option. So if I ask for a response and it's challenging for you to do that, please feel free to just sit back and relax. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share. So, do we have a question already? No. One second. Uh, somebody says they can't hear a word and see talking. Anybody else have the same problem? So do you have your speakers turned up? Oh, I guess I can't hear a word. Um, let me just te text them back and see. I uh, say so make sure. The other thing I want to remind everyone is um, if you go to speaker view on the top right, uh, and then I'm going to wave so you can see who I am, then you can go to the three dots inside of my frame, and you pin my video is the other way to make sure that you're not um, going back and forth between Gail and I. So you can pin my video as the last clue we'll give you. I hope that helps. All right, so last week we gave an introduction and we talked about how Frederick Matthias Alexander as a young actor had a problem. Um, and his problem was that he lost his voice on stage. So in essence, Alexander Technique is really a problem solving kit. And what does it solve? It solves all kinds of problems about our functioning so that we can feel and function at our best. Do I want to make her bigger? Yeah. So someone isn't muted, Gail. Um. You might mute all and then unmute me again. Might be the easiest way to do it. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out how to do that. I've never done that before. Let's see. So if you go to participants in the bottom. Okay. And yes, this is session two, someone's asking. Is this one of the tools needed to change the criminal justice system? It's okay. It's uh, uh, coming together on policies and... Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> We're hearing somebody else. So just so you know, um, if anyone's interested in watching session one, if they missed it last week or they want to see it again, it's on the friendslifecare.org website. 
you just go to resources, scroll down to wellness webinars, and you will see it posted there. And that's where we're going to post all the classes. Uh, they'll be there the, um, the morning after the class. So this class will be on there tomorrow morning. And I'm also putting my website in the chat box for everyone. Um, would you raise your hand if you're having a problem with the sound, hearing it? Oh, so it doesn't seem to be a problem for most people. Okay. I think we got it solved. Yay. Okay. Okay, good. Deep breaths, everyone. The technology is always the most difficult part. We'll get through it together. All right. So, Mr. Alexander, let's see. Um, So there's my website, everybody. Hope you can see that, www.atphila.com. You can find out about, I have seven classes a week online on Zoom, and you can find out all about that there, as well as my new four-week program. And I wanted to start with this quote today. And let's see if I can make sure that you can see it. Oops, let's go back. Um, if you think down, you will go down. And if you think up, you will go up. You will always travel the direction of your thinking. And I thought that was just the most appropriate way to start. Because in essence, this that we have for problem solving is all about self-awareness and all about directing our thoughts. Because indeed, we always physically do what we think. And if I ask you to do uh, just a very brief experiment with me for a moment. Oh, I keep doing that. Let's see. We're a little clunky in our, uh, in our technology today. But if I ask you to do an experiment with me for a moment and just think about uh, something super pleasant, maybe the most beautiful place you've ever been. It could be a mountain vista or it could be an ocean view. Maybe it's your reading nook. Maybe that's the most beautiful, comfortable place you have. Mm -hmm. And I just want you to feel what happens in you when you think of that place. Notice how light or heavy you feel, how buoyant you feel. And then think about something troubling. And unfortunately, there are plenty of stimuli these days. You might be concerned about someone in your family and their health, the state of our country. And just notice what happens in you. Notice how much space you're inhabiting, how light or free you feel. And now go back, go back to your happy place. Go back to the mountain vista, the ocean view, the favorite reading nook, the embrace of your loved ones. Just notice that your overall muscle tone and movement quality change in response to what you're thinking. Give me a thumbs up if you were able to feel a difference in that tour. Put a thumbs up if you noticed a change in your own movement quality or in how your own appreciation of what you felt like. Thank you for those responses. So we always go in the direction we think. So I love to think about this because a lot of times, you know, things are hard, especially right now. This morning is the perfect example. So many hurdles with technology. So the more I decide something's hard, the more likely I'm likely to kind of tighten up and overwork and come out of balance. And unfortunately, the catch-22 is that's going to make whatever the task is harder. So what can we do about that? Well, we can choose our response. Oh, geez. Now I've lost my screen. Mm -hmm. 
We'll get it, guys. There it is. <laughs> we have an opportunity to, to choose the response to a stimulus. So here's one of my favorites is that if you've ever gotten in a car and forgotten to take off the parking brake and started to drive, you may have noticed that the car doesn't drive so well. So give me a thumbs up if you've ever been a person that got in a car and drove with the parking brake on. I remember once I was in New York City and watched in great horror as the parking attendant drove my car off one of those lifts with my parking brake on. And I was so upset because I knew it was gonna wear my brakes out and it was, I was, my car was gonna need an alignment afterwards because it was gonna throw its alignment out. But indeed, this young man unwittingly drove my car right off that lift with the parking lot, with the parking brake, excuse me, engaged. So here's the funny thing that I know. I know we all drive better without the parking brake on. So I call that liberating your inner Ferrari because I have an active imagination. And I can imagine that that Ferrari would drive better without its parking brake. An unnecessary tension is like driving with your parking brake on. I should do that from the beginning. There's my Ferrari. Yes? So we talked last week about the tortoise. And we talked about when a tortoise is startled, it compresses and pulls itself into its shell. And it does that motion simultaneously from all directions. And I said, the tortoise isn't the only one with a startle. We have one too, and we do the same thing. We pull our head into our body. We, we withdraw our limbs in towards our torso. And then we did some experimenting last week with releasing just our head and trying to look around. And then we tried to just release our arms and we talked about trying to release tension in our arms. And then we experimented with emerging simultaneously in all directions. So I think we need to repeat that experiment. So I'm gonna talk you through it. We're gonna do it all together. So I'm gonna ask you to again, very gently, Notice what happens when you think about something troubling. And you might notice that your head starts to pull in towards your torso. And you might even notice that your shoulders start to come up because your arms are retracting in towards your torso. And if you really pay attention, you might notice your toes are curling up a little bit and your legs are pulling into your torso. Just decide to do it gently, please. So now, if we go back to our happy place, I'm thinking about this beautiful summit on Mount Kinabalu that I climbed before COVID. And I'm gonna let my head emerge from my torso as I let my arms free out and away towards my hands and my legs are freeing out towards my feet, simultaneously emerging out and away from my torso. So then very gently come back into your tortoise shell and try to just let your head pop out. And then that's a little ridiculous. So come back into your tortoise shell and now try to just shake tension out from your hands and reach your hands out without letting anything else move. And that doesn't feel very good. So we're gonna come back into our tortoise shell and now here's the key. Everything moves simultaneously out and away. So as my head frees away from my torso, my tail goes into the chair, my arms go towards my hands, and my legs go all the way towards my feet. So everything moves simultaneously. So when we're pulled in towards our tortoise shell, that is a lot of compression which is a little bit like putting your own parking brake on. And parking brakes are needed, but not for when we wanna go somewhere. So you might wanna, it's fine to go into your tortoise shell, but that's not a place you wanna stay when it's time to go somewhere. 
So I'm gonna do one more experiment with the parking brake. If you care to join me, those of you that have room and are in the mood, we're gonna stand up. And I'm gonna ask you to just take a few steps away from the screen if you have room. And it's okay if you just wanna watch, that's okay too. But the more we understand this work experientially, the more it becomes ours. Yes? We learn by doing. So what I want you to do, if you're game for the experiment, is very gently contract into your tortoise shell. So my legs are pulling up, my arms are clutching in, and my head is pulled down. I'm doing it a lot because I want you to be able to see it. You can just do a little mini one. So I'm gonna pull in, and then when I say go, I want you to walk towards the screen towards me. Ready? And go. And then come on back. And here's experiment number two. Before we go, we undo our parking brake. So before we go, we release our head <laughs> on top of our spine. We let our tail go. Let our feet gently go to the floor and let our arms free. Ariel, you're muted. You got to come off mute. Thank you so much for telling me. We're going to try that again. We're doing an experiment. It has two phases. Phase one of our experiment is we engage the parking brake. We very gently, purposefully pull our head and our limbs in towards our torso. So that's engaging my parking brake. And then I want you to experience what that feels like to go, to walk, when you have your parking brake on. And we're gonna come on back. Experiment number two, we release the parking brake. We release our head on top of our spine. We let our bottom of our pelvis go away from our head. We let our arms and legs extend out and away towards our hands and feet. And we continue releasing out the way to go, to walk towards the computer. So if you're able to, and if you notice a difference, give me a thumbs up if you could feel a difference. And in the chat, let us know what that difference felt like. So, I'm going to demonstrate something because I want you to see how normal this looks. I'm going to give you a side profile. And I want you to notice if you've ever been walking, perhaps in a city with stoplights and waited at a corner. I want you to notice a habit that looks pretty familiar, I think. Here I am waiting for the light to turn green. And here's the green light. Did you see me collapse before I walked? Give me a thumbs up if you saw me do that. I'll do it again. I'm waiting for the green light. A lot of people end up compressing and unwittingly putting on their parking brake before they move, which is hard to understand. And it doesn't feel very good, does it? feels much better when we take that break off.
So that's our tortoise. So I want you to, whoa, there we go. <laughs> I want you to know that head balance is absolutely key to Mr. Alexander's discoveries. And someone actually, when we asked you to give us your kind of requests of what you, the problems you wanted us to address in this course, someone talked about forward head position and the fact, and a lot of people talked about their neck pain. And um, this diagram, if you can see it, is this is now actually a medical diagnosis of forward head position, FHP, also commonly referred to as text neck. And you can see in this diagram that the further forward your head weight comes, it's exerting exponentially more downward pressure throughout the system. And what I want you to see is that when your head weight is upright, your head weight's actually falling over your spine. And when your head weight is forward, it's kind of out over nothing. And so what's holding up your head weight is your neck and back muscles. I'm gonna say that again. When our head weight is upright, it's being balanced over <clears throat> our spine. And when our head weight falls down and forward towards our computer or our phone or our book or our knitting, that head weight is over nothing. So now it's not my spine that's carrying the weight, it's my neck and back muscles. Yeah? So, what I'd like you to do is join me for a moment. And I'd like you to place one hand on your belly. And I'd like you to place your other hand in the small of your back, behind your belly. And what I want you to know is that the weight-bearing portion of your spine the weight-bearing portion of your spine is in between your hands. So if I show you on Fred, the bony bit you can feel with your back hand is part of your spine, but it's not the weight-bearing portion. The weight-bearing portion, the vertebral body, is much further forward. The big chunky part is in between your hands, in the middle. So now, what I'd like you to do is ask where your head weight is. So I just drop my head weight down, and if you do that with me, you might feel the muscles in your back kind of pop out a little bit. So now, if I float my head weight up and back, you're gonna feel a moment when your back muscles release a bit. Oh, excuse me, Arielle, someone asked if you could take off your sweater so they could see more of what you're talking about. Sure, thank you for that response. Mm -hmm. Happy to do that. And also someone had a question about forward flex in, when sleeping. I'm sorry, the question is what? About like when they're sleeping and when they're, if their head goes forward when they're sleeping, forward flex and when sleeping. What do you do about, is there anything to do about that? Absolutely, thank you for that question. So, I'm gonna do it this way. So there's my hand on my belly. And there's the hand in the small of my back. And there's my head dropping down. And you'll feel your back muscles kind of tighten up a little bit. Because again, when my head weight is over nothing, my back and my neck muscles have to work harder. So then way up here is where the top of my spine is. So I'm just going to very gently float my head weight up and back. And I'm going to ask, when is my head weight over the middle of my middle? and I'll feel my back muscles soften. And actually, if you'll notice, my belly kind of gathers back in. So when I drop down, I get kind of poof here. And when I float my head up and back, my abdominal wall will do just the right amount of work to hold my head weight. I'm not asking you to tighten your core. I'm asking you to notice 
that your core will start to work in good tone when your head is in balance. So I'm curious if any of you could feel your back muscles change as you moved where your head weight was. So give me a thumbs up if you were able to feel that difference. And I just want to remind you, that's awesome, that people could feel it. I just want to remind you about Mr. Alexander's story that at first he couldn't notice the difference. He couldn't notice his habit and he kept going. So my mission number one is to get you curious and to encourage you to keep experimenting. So thank you for that question about forward head when you sleep, especially if, well, I'm not going to say especially, if you're laying on your back and your pillow is too high, um, it will give you forward head position. And I will tell you that right now, uh, in hotels and motels, really big pillows seem to be all the rage. And they're too high for me. And I travel with my own pillow because I got a back spasm once when I was at a friend's house and slept on a pillow that was too high because my head was too far forward all night. So at home, it's super important to make sure your pillow is just the right height. And what's just the right height? I want my head weight over the middle of my middle. This is too low on my back. This is too high. But the place people get in trouble with forward head and sleeping is when you're on your side, right? Because usually when people are on their side, they'll do something like this. Yes? So when I'm laying on my side in my bed, I float my head up and back in space until it's over the middle of my middle. And I have taught myself to check in and make sure. Now, it doesn't float as easily when I'm laying on my side because I'm on a pillow. So I have to lightly pick up my head and move it back. But I really um, encourage you to pay attention to that tonight. Uh, whether you're laying on your back and making sure your head, uh, your pillow height is correct, or if you're on your side to make sure you haven't pulled your head forward. And then shoot me an email and let me know if you get a better night's sleep or if you wake up with not so stiff a neck. If you're someone that's waking up in the morning with a really stiff neck, this is very likely a culprit of what's going on. It may not be the only thing that's going on, but in my experience, I cannot tell you how many students have come back for their next lesson deliriously happy to have gotten rid of some of their neck pain. Mm -hmm. so my, if, if someone said that they're a side sleeper and they just noticed that a few days ago, that they noticed that they had that problem. Wonderful. Well, yeah. that's exciting and I won't take credit for it. <laughs> I will say that when we start to bring self-awareness as a tool, you'll start to make discoveries just like Mr. Alexander did. Because he didn't create the Ferrari guys. He created a system to take the parking brake off the Ferrari. Right. Ferrari is yours. <clears throat> you don't have to create buoyancy. <clears throat> Excuse me, you just have to get out of its way. Phew. So I have a couple other questions for you too. So I have two. So someone said in the previous exercise when they were standing, they noticed that the, um, the tightness in their upper back and neck muscles, but not the, I guess they noticed the, um, the effect in their upper back and neck muscles, but not their lower muscles. And then someone else um, asked if you could explain um, neck float. Sure. <laughs> well, that's a lifetime, but I would be happy to, yes. Okay. Um, so, um, we're, we're all going to feel this strain kind of in our weakest link. So I go to the low back because that's a super common place where people feel tension. But when my head is coming forward, then my upper back is getting pulled on because uh, of my head weight. So we could actually repeat the same experiment, putting our hands lightly on our trapezius muscles here. And as I let my head weight come back and forward, you'll also feel your neck muscles soften. So that's just another experiment we could do. Um, so head float, funny you should ask. Let's see, I think my next slide might be. Ah, so um, I, I'm gonna get to your question about head float in a moment if I can, if I can continue with my story and sneak it in there. Uh, here's a picture of Mr. Alexander in his 80s. 
Um, and looping back to the beginning of my talk today about we always do what we think, I think it's super important to do some posture myth busting. Be Ooh, I messed up. Um, because we always do what we think. And so if our ideas about posture are not helpful, we're actually unwittingly going to be adding the parking brake on when we work hard on our posture, we're gonna be interfering with our buoyant balance. So it's super important to be accurate with our thoughts, yes? So here's my three myths I wanna bust for you. Posture is not a place. Human beings have lots of moving bits and there is no one right place. Last week, I showed a slide about a tightrope walker and talked about balance being micro movement. So posture is the same thing. There is always some small movement. So we're gonna do a very brief experiment to get, oh, I keep doing that. We're having a clunky technology day today. I'm just gonna calm myself down. We're gonna get through this together. If you'd like to stand with me again, I invite you to do so. You can also do this seated. I just think it's a little easier to feel standing. And if you just stand for a moment, there's a dancer that developed something called contact improvisation. And he used to have people close their eyes and just notice small movements. You might notice them in your ankle joints, in your hip joints, in little tiny shiftings of weight. My ribs move as I breathe. My fingers. We call that the small dance. So if we take a moment to notice ourselves, even in the midst of what we would call stillness, there is always movement. So now let your eyes open if they've been closed and just ask, where is my head weight resting? And ask if it's over your toes or over the middle of your middle and your ankle joints if you're standing. And if you're sitting, I want the middle of my skull resting over the middle of my middle and my sit bones. So to start to address, and I love some of you are using your hands to help you know where the middle of your middle is, because I think that's helpful. So this idea of floating that someone asked about, there's two things I wanna say about that. And we're gonna talk about it a little bit later, but I'll introduce the two ideas now. <clears throat> Float to me is a qualitative word. So I didn't say put your head over the middle of your middle, Floating to me is an effort quality that's quite light. So if we think about our Ferrari <clears throat> and disengaging the parking brake, it's a release. So actually, let's do this together, please. We're all going to make a fist and we're gonna squeeze. So that's engaging the parking brake. Squeeze, 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 squeeze. And now what I want you to do is look at your hands and let go. And then we're gonna repeat that experiment. So we're gonna engage the parking brake. And then we're gonna watch our hands and we're going to disengage. We're just gonna let go. So there's movement when you let go, isn't there? And it is a movement quality of release. So now if you make a fist and you go directly to opening your hand, you might notice that movement quality feels a little different. 
my hands feel quite a bit tighter when I go directly to open. And if I go from fist to release and then open, you might notice your hands might feel a little bit more open. Let me know in the reactions if you could feel that difference. If you'd like to join me and let me know. So floating is not adding more pressure or effort. It's actually releasing and thinking with a light effort quality. And it's also moving very clearly from where our head meets our spine. And that's what we're gonna talk about next. Oh, and Aria, we have a few questions. We had a few people that said they do feel more open and they found it easier to align and float their head when um, they release their arms, um, head and tail all at once, um, which is wonderful. Um, somebody else, before we did that experiment, had written in that said that she's had tension in her shoulders um, for a long time, for years and years and years. And then I have one other question, if you want me to go there or do you want me to wait? Um, sure, you can give me the question. Okay, so, um, and I have one from way back in the beginning too that I never had a chance to ask you, so I can, um, I can, whenever you want that one, but why does it matter if the head is forward or in sleep, the weight of the skull is supported by the bed or the pillow? Yeah, wow. Okay, because when your head weight is forward, you're absolutely right when we switch the relationship to gravity, but when my head it is forward, even if it's being supported by the bed and the pillow, I'm overstretching the upper set of my trapezius muscles. And then what that's doing is it's practicing your habit so that number one, you're gonna, it's easier to do your habit over and over. It's always easier to do what you've practiced. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's why we practice. But we wanna practice what we wanna do. We wanna go in the direction we wanna go. So you're still, those muscles when you're resting. You're also interfering with your air column. Someone asked me about breathing in their request from last week, and your air column hangs freely up and down. And the minute I start to advance my head forward, I've interfered with my breathing. So if you're someone, you know, sleep apnea is such a common malady today, and people have very fancy contraptions. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you don't need the contraption. What I'm saying is you want to take the parking brake off your Ferrari and get your head in balance so that you're not interfering with your breathing mechanism. Um, so, yeah, I forgot. I had another question I was supposed to address. Had too many questions there. Oh, okay. I, had, I actually hadn't asked you the other one yet. So, <laughs> so you didn't forget it. Okay, so this was back in the beginning when you were talking about feeling stressed you know, and about how our body constricts when we feel stressed. Um, yeah. So someone asked, when thinking about troubling things, many people have predominant GI type symptoms. Um, what does the Alexander Technique say about that? So the Alexander Technique doesn't say anything directly. We never promise to fix your problems. <laughs> our approach is systemic. I am not medically trained, but today's class is all about when you take that parking brake off, everything works better. When I pull down and into my tortoiseshell, I am literally sitting on my digestive system. I am literally compressing my respiratory system. I've taken my air column off axis, so it's harder for air to move. It's harder for my circulatory system to work because I'm sitting on it. And I am literally pressing into my digestive system. So which is going to make it easier for things to move through my digestive system when I'm sitting on it mm -hmm. or when I'm not sitting on it and allowing room for it to work? I'm not going to cure your digestive problems, but your digestive system more than likely will start to work better when it's not compromised by all that downward pressure. The downward pressure is the parking brake. Yes, just like Mr. Alexander was apparently never diagnosed with asthma, but as a young man was quite sickly and had a lot of respiratory ailments. And when he figured out how to come into buoyant balance, his respiratory um, situation went away. He was fine, right? Mm -hmm. 
did he cure his asthma? No. But when he was driving around without that parking brake on, he didn't notice it anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, Ariel, that's really interesting. You said that someone had a comment that they had a slightly stuffy nose, which is now gone, you know, from doing, from just moving differently, which is wonderful news. So very encouraging for others. Um, and someone else said they can control their head movement better than their shoulders. And it seems like she feels like her shoulders look like they're forward, even when she's consciously trying to hold them back. So glad you asked that question because you are right on my page. That's what we're talking about next. Thank you for that beautiful segue. I always oh, I have one other. What other question? Sorry, is there a checklist for this principle so we can practice? Is there like a, a, a form to follow? Or so that's a great question. Um, I will give you a kind of. I actually instead of thinking of a checklist and a form, I like to ask questions. And uh, that kind of inquiring minds want to know, that spirit of investigating and, and inquiring with our self-awareness um, is helpful. But remember, I just want to remind you that when we did our experiment with the tortoise, that it was getting the whole of you moving simultaneously that had the best effect. If I came into myself and first freed my arms and then freed my head and then thought about my legs, it would not feel as free. Try it with me. Try to do one after. So go arms, head, legs. Now come back in. And if, uh, if I could say it all at the same time, I would. Head, arms, leg, all at the same time. So that simultaneity is key. And in language, it's tough, because in language, I gotta go one after the other. But I want you to remember that getting everything all together with Mr. Alexander's language is what's gonna really help. So my short answer is head balance first. <laughs> Where is my head? Where is my head over the middle of my middle? It's gonna be your very first question. Is my head over the middle of my middle? So a lot of people are asking about shoulders because a lot of people have sore shoulders. And what I want you to know is that when your head weight drops forward, you're literally pulling. It's like a boat pulling against its anchor because your shoulders have been pulled over by your head. And if you just move your head, it's going to pull on your shoulders more. So let's see. Oh, we have some more myths. Oh, uh, before you go to that, someone else had a question about how to relax their toes. <laughs> well, the good news is toes are connected. And so if you allow your whole leg to free towards your feet, your toes will start to uncurl. And that's something that really happens a lot as we age, that people's toes start retracting. And a lot of that is because they're worried about their balance. And as they're worried about their balance, they draw into the tortoise shell instead of releasing, remember our fists releasing out and away. So here's a funny thing. Posture is in a place and our spines are not straight. Our spines are curvy. I always like to back up what I say, but if you can see Fred here, I'm going to take off his scarf today. And I'm going to show you that from the bottom, and you can trace this on yourself. Your, your tailbone, you can't feel, but it's curved forward. And then your sacrum, you can feel right back here, curves back. And then our lumbar spine is forward. That's the middle of your middle. And then our thoracic spine frees back. Our neck curve starts going forward, but it doesn't stay forward. Our neck curve goes forward and then comes up and back to hold our head weight. So if I think, remember we always do what we think, right? So if I ask you all to sit up straight, put a thumbs up if you just added tension. If you're not sure, repeat the experiment. So if I ask you to stand up straight or sit up straight, I 
I have never yet ever seen anyone do that without adding tension, without putting the parking brake on. Why? Because it's too static an idea. You went for a place and you tried to make your spine straight. And I took years of ballet and that's an aesthetic choice in ballet, not a functional one. The curves are there for many good reasons. And what we want to do is lengthen through those curves. So I like to think about these like hammocks and domes. So you're going to let the hammock, if I'm laying on my back, my sacrum hangs back like a hammock to let my low back dome forward, to let my spine in between my shoulder blades hammock back, to let the dome of my neck come forward, and then the hammock of my skull be back. And just see if that makes you feel a little bit freer. If you're not sure, repeat the experiment. So I just want you to see if I sit up straight, I actually get rid of my upper back curve and usually overdo it. If I think about the curve, so now we're gonna float from the top of our spine. So if you point in from your ears and nod, that's where your head meets your spine. So you're gonna float your head up and back over the middle of your middle. And just notice that I have curves that go back, curves that go forward, curves that go back, curves that go forward, and my skull actually comes back as well. Oh, and Ariel, um, someone asked if there are any other analogies that you could use. Like, uh, maybe they didn't really resonate with the hammock. Can you think of anything else? Um, well, the other way to think about it is uh, in Raymond Dart's work, primary and secondary curves. So when you were born, babies are all curled forward in the womb, and those are called your primary curves. So before about six months old, before you were able to sit up, you only had primary curves. So that's your upper back curve and your sacral curve. Then actually before six months, you started to look up and you developed a curve, a secondary curve in your neck to let you bring your head up. And then around six months old, to sit up, you developed a secondary curve in your low back. So my secondary curves go towards the front of my body and my primary curves go towards the back of my body. And one leads into the other snaking like a river. So I hope that helps to talk about it a different way. That sounds good. And somebody else said that um, the soldiers standing at attention, they're probably, they're all in the wrong position. Um, well, again, it's not so much about a position, but yes, they are holding position. And uh, I have a funny story uh, to tell about that, which is um, the Curtis Opera did an opera a number of years ago and the director had the chorus stand for 40 minutes during act two at the front of the stage and they weren't supposed to move and someone passed out as a matter of fact this happens sometimes to military people they'll pass out now most people know that you're not supposed to lock your knees that that actually is what causes the passing out but when you're not in tune with micro movement it doesn't work out well. You're really interfering with your functioning. So um, there is a way to stand upright and not wiggle around without locking down the system and causing yourself to lock out, to pass out rather. <laughs> so um, I wanna get to this shoulder idea because I know some of you really want me to talk about shoulders today. So first I'm gonna go back to my myth busting and I want you to know that your shoulders do not belong back and down. I don't know what it is about shoulders that so many, oh, I keep doing that, I'm sorry. Uh, so many people tell you to bring your shoulders back and down. They'll tell you that in a yoga class, a dance class, possibly even in a meditation class. 
and I'm not fond of it. And I'll tell you why. Because most of the time when I see people do that, they add tension. So never believe me, let's do the experiment. Please have a slump, gently. And now put your shoulders back and down. Now, most of us got a little bit more upright, but I want you to feel what happened to your neck. Because if I'm slumped and my head is forward and I pull my shoulders back, I just added tension to my neck. You will never reduce tension by adding tension. Mm. You will never reduce tension by adding it. You will reduce tension by coming into balance. So now experiment number two, gently go in your slump, lead movement from the top of your spine. Lead movement from the knotting joints up and back and allow your shoulders to carry along with you because shoulders do not belong in the back of my torso and they don't belong in the front of my torso. Shoulders actually belong in the middle. The shoulder joint is actually in the middle. And I have a fun little tool. which is a googly eye sticker that I'm gonna put right on the top of my humerus bone, my arm bone. So if I slump, the eyeball starts rolling forward. Did you see that? So now my shoulder joint where my arm bone meets my shoulder blade just move forward in space. If I pull my shoulders back to be in the back of my torso, I just increase my neck tension. Mm. So I don't recommend that. That's like putting a second parking brake on. You're not gonna drive better. So instead, when my head floats up and back in space, I'm gonna allow my shoulder bridge to follow along. And lo and behold, now my shoulder joint and my arm is oriented to the side of my body in the middle of my torso, forward back. So I like to say my shoulders hang out because the shoulder bridge is actually suspended from your sternum. So I don't need to pull it down and I don't need to pull it back. Stop pulling on it, release your parking brake, get your head in balance and allow those shoulders to carry along with you. So for the person who feels like their neck hurts, I'm sorry, your shoulders hurt all the time. First, someone asked me, what's the order? First, ask about head balance. Always ask where your head is in balance first. Then you wanna ask a second question. So the first question is, is my head leading? So heads lead and bodies follow like a cobra winding its way out of a basket. We don't wanna push or pull and that's what I'm gonna talk about next. So um, I, this is a fun picture of some kittens. I want you to see the kitten on the left. The head is leading its body back, getting ready to pounce. And the kitten on the right has its head leading its body out into the palace. <laughs> cute. If you have a cat at home, it's fun uh, to see that. But if my head is not leading, right? So let's say I'm in a slump and I don't lead here. If I lead here, that's what most people do when they sit up straight. They may do it more from their low back. They may do it more from their chest, right? They may do it from their shoulders, but I just added quite a bit of tension. So go back to your stand up straight or sit up straight habit and see if you can catch yourself in your habit and see where you lead movement from. Some people stand up straight from their legs. They kind of push from their legs. See if your tension increases when you push. So a lot of times people push their thoracic spine forward 
And that kind of causes more tension in your shoulders. So that person with shoulder tension, I want you to do that experiment because I have a very educated guess that's what's going on. All right, so we don't want pushing. We want leading from the top of your spine. So now find your knotting joints. And then remember float means we don't push or pull. We don't add tension. So we're gonna release. So we're gonna float our head as delicately as we can up and back in space. Let your shoulders carry along with and see if you still have a nice curvy spine. But here's the other problem that happens. I kind of went through the slides quickly because I'm running out of time. But my teacher used to say, no pushy, no pulley. So what we want is my hand is a head and my band is a body, right? So this is a slump, downward pull. I want my head to lead and my body to follow into dangled length. If I push, Here's my head, here's my body. If I push, I lead from something other than my head. And the wrinkles of my band move, but they don't disappear. If I lead with my head, I get rid of the wrinkles. But here's the other thing that can happen. Sometimes we pull. So sometimes I might start leading with my head, but I've stepped on my body. So if I do that, I'm gonna get quite uncomfortable at the border of what's moving and what's not moving. So right above my hand is getting quite a yank. Can you see that? So if my head, here's my head, my hand, is leading, but I don't allow my body to follow, I get a pull right at the border, right above my hand, my other hand. So if I take away that, my whole body can literally fall upwards. So what does that look like? I'll show you. So if I'm here in my slump and I push is something other than my head leading, I kind of undo all my curves. I've just got one curve. So if I pull, maybe my head's leading, but my body isn't following. So that's gonna feel really uncomfortable right at the border. So right now my shoulders and my neck are getting yanked on because my head's moving, but my body isn't following. So when my head leads and my whole body follows, that's my shoulders carrying along, my hips are moving all the way to the floor because I'm standing, then I get that nice, buoyant balance. So head leads, body follows, no pushy, no pulley. Now that takes a little bit of practice. So I'm gonna encourage you all to do some practicing and we're gonna go over that again next week because where did the time go? We had some technical difficulties today. My apologies all around. Thank you so much for your patience. Um, but we'll review next week. And here's what I want you to think about as you practice. It matters what I think because I'm always gonna do what I think. So you might be a little unclear about what we did today. I've been working on this 40 years and it's getting richer and more clear all the time. So it's completely okay that you don't completely understand what we've gone over. Just be curious, wonder, ask, say, hmm, head weight is key. I wonder where my head weight is right now. And then you might ask, can I let my head weight Float, right? That's a taking tension away idea, not adding tension. Can I let my head weight float over the middle of my middle? And then you ask, did my head lead and did my whole body follow? Those are the questions we want to ask. And actually, the funny thing is, is asking the question is more important than knowing the answer. I know that sounds really funny and goes against a lot of our educational training, but asking the question and crafting the question is super important because that's how you're gonna get your sensory information getting more accurate. Because right now you might ask those questions and the answer might be, I have no idea. 
And that's okay, keep asking. It's the persistence that served Mr. Alexander so well, and it really is the persistence that's gonna serve you as well. I'm so sorry I didn't get to all your questions, but luckily for us, we have four more weeks. I promise to pick up where we ended off today with head leads, body follows, no pushy, no pulley. I encourage you to not believe a word I said about these postural myths, but to actually do the experiments. So what were the experiments? First myth was that posture is a place. So I want you to pick a task that you do, brushing <clears throat> your teeth, and really try to fix your posture and then see how comfortable it is to brush your teeth if you're thinking of posture as a place. And then just take the parking brake off and see what moves, see if you can find the small dance as you brush your teeth and see if it gets more comfortable. Postural myth number two was that your spine is straight. It is not straight. Same experiment, you could pick the same task the next day or you could pick a different task. You could say, I'm gonna sit my coffee and I'm really gonna sit up straight. See how that goes for you. See if that feels like your parking brake is on or think about how curvy those spines are. You can think about the primary and secondary curves, the baby curves and then the picking up your head and sitting up curves. Or you can think about the domes and the hammocks, whichever one works best or even don't know where the curves are. Just say, oh, how curvy is my spine? Just ask the question and then drink your coffee and see which one feels more buoyant, which one feels more like your Ferrari is unleashed. Our third postural myth was that your shoulders do not belong back and down. That is an overcorrection to get you to stop slumping forward. But the slumping forward is generated from your head weight. So fix it from your head weight. Yes? Good. Carry your head weight and allow your shoulders to carry to the middle of your torso, forward back. That's where they're designed to be. And then do the experiment. Put your shoulders back and down and open a door. See how that feels because you're going to feel it in your neck. I'm almost going to place money on that. If you put your shoulders back and down and go to open a door, you're gonna feel a yank in your neck muscles. And then repeat the experiment and say, oh, where's my head weight? And can I let my shoulder weight carry to the middle of my middle? And then open the door or pick something up. Feel free to let me know how your experiments go. My email is in the chat. It's ariel at atphila.com. And my website is also in the chat. I'll put them again so they're at the end. www.atphila.com. Dot com. There's a YouTube channel on my website with more instructional videos. There's going to be a recording of today's class that's also going to be on the Friends Life Care website. Do I have that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, friendslifecare.org. Under go to the resources tab and then scroll down to wellness webinars. Sure. This class will be on there tomorrow morning. And then I am putting both my website and my email addresses back in the chat for everyone. I went a little over my apologies. Thank you. Again. Oh, Aria, oh, could I ask you one thing? Somebody had, uh, they're confused, and I just don't know if anybody else would be a bit confused about this. She said, your slide says a myth is that shoulders should be in the middle, but you are now saying um, that is what, that they shouldn't be in the middle, but now you're saying that's what should be, which is right. Thank you. I'll clarify. My apologies if I said the wrong thing. To me, the myth is that shoulders belong back and down. That's the myth. The accurate physiological truth is that your shoulder joints are in the middle of your torso, front to back. I'm gonna bring Fred. Yeah. I have precise. All right, someone's speaking and I didn't hear what you said. Yeah, that was, they should, yeah, that was a mistake. They shouldn't have been, they were not muted. So if I put my arms at the front of Fred's torso and the back, you'll see that his arm bone and his shoulder joint are in between my arms. So the myth, just to be super clear, my apologies for not being clear, the myth 
is that your shoulders belong back and down. That's an overcorrection. The physiological truth is that your shoulders belong in the middle of your torso. Remember my eyeballs? Oh, there's my eyeball, right? So they don't belong back here, guys. They belong right in the middle. I hope that helped clear it up. Thank you for always letting me know because I do make mistakes. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. We're gonna, we're gonna really put a good thought in that our internet is working and we have a smooth start to our session. And don't forget, we have four more sessions. So I'll be able to clarify and address your questions. It's super helpful if you send those questions in advance. It'll help me kind of prepare. And I love your questions, so keep them coming. Let me know how those experiments go, everyone. Oh, thank you, everyone. Appreciate the feedback. Thanks for hanging in there with us. Thank you for your patience. Stay safe, everyone, right? Absolutely. Thanks, Ariel. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week.